While the virus has been slower to reach First Nations, the number of cases is rising daily. Tonight, a word of caution for First Nations as provinces continue lifting COVID-19 restrictions. I could also see it as an opportunity for us to develop some of the aspects of the business that I haven't had time for. And how small business owners in the Northwest Territories are managing during the pandemic. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin tonight in Ottawa where the Prime Minister had some advice for Indigenous communities ahead of some provinces opening up for business. Jamie Pachagumscum reports. At his daily press conference, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said as some regions open up their economies, Indigenous communities will need continuing protection. Right across the country, uh, various communities will take appropriate measures and we will be there as a government and other orders of government as well to support them in doing the things that need to be done uh, to keep uh, uh, elders and all in those communities safe. AFN National Chief Perry Bellegarde agreed that opening up too early will hurt First Nations. While the virus has been slower to reach First Nations, the number of cases is rising daily. For reasons that I will get into in a minute, there is a reasonable concern that COVID-19 will have a disproportionately negative effect on First Nations, as did the H1N1 virus did in 2009. I fear that there are already far more cases among our people than we currently know. The conditions Belgard referred to are the social and economic gaps between First Nations and the rest of Canada. This was a point also made by Natan Obed, president of the Inuit Taparit Kanatomy. He said the reason Inuit Nunangat handled the situation so well was quick action from its leadership. The success uh, to date is a testament to the um, efficacy of the government structures that are in place across Inuit Nunangat and also the relationships that we now have with the federal government, with provinces and territories, and also within the self-determination of Inuit leadership from um, Nunatsievu, Nunavik, Nunavut, and the Inuvialut region. It shows what's, what can be achieved when Inuit self-determination and strong partnerships with governments work together for a common concern and common goal. Trudeau says continued vigilance is key in preventing outside COVID-19 cases entering Indigenous communities. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. Daily COVID-19 numbers have started to go down in some provinces, and the reported case in Nunavut last week was a false positive. The territory remains the only place in Canada with zero cases. In Quebec this week, one case reported in Mysticini resulted in a death. There are nine cases on Walpole Island, First Nation, in southern Ontario. Manitoba is still clear of COVID-19 cases in Indigenous communities. In Saskatchewan, the northern village of Laloche continues to see a rapid increase in COVID-19 cases. Since we last reported one week ago, they have added 100 new cases and are up to 129. There are two deaths and no recoveries. The Blood Tribe in Alberta is the latest province to report a case of COVID-19 in that province. Doeg River First Nation in BC added one new case. And nationally, Quebec has 36,150 cases. Ontario was just shy of 20,000 cases. Nationally, across Canada, there are a total of 66,327 cases. There have been 4,567 deaths and 29,961 people have recovered. We want to hear what you think about provinces lifting COVID-19 restrictions. Here's how to share your comments. You can email news at aptn.ca, find us online at aptnnews.ca, and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also leave your comments on any of our social media pages. Kashichuan continues to prepare for its annual flooding as the spring breakup on the Albany River quickly approaches. About 800 members are out isolating in the bush, 400 more are expected to join them, and another 400 are expected to remain in the community. Chief Leo Friday declared a state of emergency on May 1st and asked the province for emergency shelters in the event of flooding. The province says they are working with the feds to support their request, but no commitments have been made yet. And last month, the federal government 
announced a $1.7 billion fund to clean up orphaned oil wells across BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. And Indigenous owned companies have signed up. Chris Stewart has more. PIMI Well Servicing has been in business since 1984. Owned by six First Nation bands in Alberta, they provide rigs for drilling oil and maintenance for oil sites. Our rigs, our service rigs that are out there for for some of the our vendors, our customers, you know, they're they're working out there. They're they're trying to maintain um, the current shifts that are are be, are uh, out there. But our our guys are having to take all the precautions that uh, are necessary to to deal with COVID. PIMI applied to be part of the $1 billion fund for Alberta's share of the federal government's site rehabilitation program to clean and restore orphaned wells, pipelines, and gas sites. And the number of abandoned wells is massive. 140,000 that are inactive right now. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a need to, to be able to make that investment to, to clean them up uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's only right in, uh, to deal with uh, any environmental concerns. And I think for a company like ours, it's, it's, it's going to be an opportunity. The federal government said in just four days, there were nearly 20,000 applications to clean up a century of abandoned oil wells. Jackson says if they are awarded the cleanup opportunity, they will be expanding their workforce, which is over 100 currently, with 97% of their workers being indigenous. With this program, you know, uh, for those wells that are inactive, you know, we get to, uh, you know, we're going to have an opportunity to participate in that and, and, and take care of that kind of business. Um, and it's going to require service rigs, you know. So I think we're going we're, we're gonna to look at uh, um, taking on this opportunity and, and being able to, uh, you know, to enhance and benefit uh, the company and, and being, a, being able to uh, create jobs for our people. The one billion dollars for the Alberta cleanup is just a fraction of the twenty to thirty billion dollars the Alberta government estimates it will take to clean all of the abandoned sites. Other estimates are much higher. So it's the taxpayers, not oil companies, that will foot the bill. There is less than two hundred and thirty million dollars in the industry paid cleanup fund to clean up old wells. Chris Stewart, APTN National News. Edmonton. In Yellowknife, community members are mourning the death of a 22-year-old Dene woman who was reported missing last week. This week, excuse me. Police today confirmed she was murdered. In her mother's Facebook post, Brianna Manacho is remembered as a kind, giving, and loving soul. She was reported missing on Wednesday with search and rescue volunteers and police patrols looking for her the same day. By the evening, RCMP responded to a house call where Manacho's body was found. Today, police announced they have charged a suspect in her death. Devin Larrabee, 27 years old, from Yellowknife, has been charged with murder, section 30, 235 of the criminal code, in connection with the death of Brianna. Devin Larrabee has been remanded and is set to, to reappear in court on May 12th. It's time for a short break, but coming up, we'll look at two businesses in the Northwest Territories and the challenges they face operating during this time. But first, here's a look at tomorrow's weather. Starting in the East Coast now, plus 10 in Charlottetown and plus 8 degrees in Halifax. Plus 2 in Nain and plus 9 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Plus 4 in Quebec City and plus 1 in Val d'Or. Plus 6 degrees in Sun and Peterborough and plus 7 in Toronto. 3 in Wawa and plus 10 in Thunder Bay. Minus 5 in Churchill and plus 3 in Thompson. Plus 5 in Gimli and plus 5 in Barron's River. Plus 8 in Saskatoon and plus 8 in Regina. Plus 1 in Stony Rapids and plus 4 in La Ronge. Welcome back. The Newfoundland and Labrador government is relaxing COVID-19 health restrictions for people who take ferries in the area. In March, ferries were restricted to essential travel only, and restrictions such as less passengers and social distancing were also imposed. Those restrictions came days after public criticism that passengers were not self-isolating and were too close together. 
Starting on Monday, the ferries will no longer be restricted to essential travelers, but people are still required to stay in their vehicles, practice social distancing, and are recommended to wear a mask. An Adikimak community in Quebec is reeling in the wake of a strange medical mix-up. Speaking to APTN this week, one family said they received the wrong results when their infant was tested for COVID-19. Lindsay Richardson reports. The presumed arrival of COVID-19 in Mariana, Ottawa's home community of Manawan in Quebec played out like a science fiction scene. Un peu comme dans e. <laughs> Except workers in hazmat suits came to escort Ottawa's family away shortly after a local doctor called to say their two-year-old son was COVID-19 positive. Four other children and her partner possibly exposed. On ne savait pas si si allait s'en sortir, si ça avait été vrai. Tu sais, on se posait des questions. Euh, est-ce que nos autres enfants, euh, est-ce qu'ils l'ont pogné entre temps? The family self-isolated in mid-April after the infant developed symptoms. A first test for COVID-19 came back negative, but symptoms persisted for days. After more tests, the child was diagnosed with a UTI and given antibiotics. Confident they had found the problem, the family ran errands around town. Hours later came a call. A second COVID-19 test was positive. Et on a été en colère aussi parce que on a vécu toute une fin de semaine euh, remplie d'émotions. Soon after, the doctor called back to say there was a mix-up in the lab. The child was actually negative, but mixed messages kept coming. Quebec Public Health called to follow up on the positive test results. Ottawa says they weren't aware of a mix-up. Je vis encore un peu de stress, mais je suis confiante parce que je regarde mon fils, puis il va très bien, il n'y a pas de symptômes, puis ça va bien. Là, puis tant qu'il va bien, ben moi, je vais, je vais bien. No one else at home tested positive. After clarifying with public health, Manawan Chief Polly Mill Ottawa reached out to assure everyone the community is still COVID-free. Mariana Ottawa addressed rumors in a Facebook Live video viewed thousands of times. On n'est pas porteur du COVID, finalement. Things are calmer now, but Ottawa is still at a loss as to how the mix-up occurred. We reached out to the Provincial Health Ministry to see if this has happened before or since, but did not hear back before deadline. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. In the Northwest Territories, there are unique challenges to operating a small business. During a pandemic, those challenges are even bigger. And even with relief funding, entrepreneurs have to be innovative to survive. Charlotte Moore Jacobs now with a look at two businesses outside Yellowknife. From a family who withstood harsh environments, Brenda Dragon won't let a pandemic break her spirit. I could also see it as an opportunity for us to develop some of the aspects of the business that I haven't had time for. Dragon is Denis Aline from Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, and the founder of Aurora Heat, a business which makes foot, ankle, and wrist warmers out of sheared beaver. Having new to market products, she's had to work her way up over the past five years. One of the challenges right now is not being able to purchase or go into a, a store to touch the products and uh, that has been a challenge because our products are about feel. I used in my ball cap, just tuck it in. And put it in. Her clients have made testimonial videos. And like in no time, it's you feel so warm. Dragon's applied for relief funding from Cannor to cover fixed expenses because her retailers can't make sales. She's not alone. Last month, the federal government promised up to $306 million in relief for small and medium-sized Indigenous businesses. But there's still many challenges. Getting your raw materials to work with. Um, the snowshoes that I get from Montreal, uh, the snowshoe companies, they've been in business for many, many years. But in the springtime, they shut down for the spring goose hunt. 
and they all go away. This year, there's not even an answering machine turned on or anything. Michael Labine is Métis and a well-known multimedia artist. It's made with the, the bottom of the leg of the moose. Sales for his business, Polar Creations, in Fort Smith have plummeted to just $200 in nine weeks. Because I've got a kiln downstairs to do the uh, glass fusing and whatnot. Yeah. So when I run that and I'm running this and my boy's welding outside, the, our power bill can be five, six hundred dollars. Labine's typically profitable blacksmithing and stained glass workshops are on hold. So he's working with Health Canada. But even that seems to be on northern time. Well, I applied this week to do the ear protectors and uh, face yeah. shields and the red tape to manufacture the face shields is just unreal. They, they want, the, the government of Canada wants us to help yep. put the material in their people's hands and I can't, right now, until I get a, their grant, I can't order the Lexane. Last week, the territorial government announced their economic plan emerged stronger. But there was no strong dollar figure attached or dates for when businesses could open. Even with few details, entrepreneurs are holding out. We want to work with our natural products. We want to ensure that uh, people who are trappers still have a way of selling their fur and their fur being used. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, The Batcha, Fort Smith. It's time for one more break, but stick around. We'll show you what a dance class for First Nations students had to do when their end-of-year competition was cancelled. But first, the rest of tomorrow's weather. Over to Western Canada now, plus 11 in High Level and plus 12 in Peace River. Plus 10 in Calgary and plus 12 in Edmonton with some sun. Plus 24 degrees in Kamloops and plus 19 in Sun in Quesnel. Plus 15 in Fort Nelson and plus 20 in Sun in Smithers. Plus 20 degrees in Dawson and 21 degrees in Beaver Creek. Plus 5 in Wrigley and plus 11 in Fort Simpson. Plus 1 in Colville Lake and plus 3 in Fort McPherson. Minus 12 in Baker Lake and minus 11 in Chesterfield. Minus 7 in Cape Dorset and plus 2 in Ecalawit. Welcome back. In Ontario, COVID-19 testing rates of First Nations is on the rise and so are the number of confirmed cases. Alina McDougall has more. In Ontario, testing for the COVID-19 virus is a priority in First Nations, right up there with long-term care homes for the elderly. Between April 17th and the 27th, 940 First Nations people have been tested, putting the First Nations test rate higher than the rest of the province. Curve Lake First Nation confirmed the first cases of COVID-19 last week. I have to wonder if our curve is going up because testing's only really just become available. Um, so that would be my thought, is that, that really it's just about testing being available and our communities being comfortable getting testing. So it looks like our curve is on the way up. The Chiefs of Ontario represents 133 First Nations. According to them, positive COVID-19 cases increased at a rate of 91% last week and 23% this week compared to 46 and 20 percent in the rest of the province. Roseanne Archibald is the regional chief with the Assembly of First Nations. She's worried. The research she's seen says more COVID-19 spikes are just around the corner. So these spikes will happen Mother's Day uh, and they will again happen on the long weekend, the May long weekend. Two weeks after that, you'll see another spike in cases increasing in Ontario. So the chiefs are warning, please stay home even if the rest of the province is relaxing some restrictions. If your chief and council asks you to stay home longer than the rest of the province, that is for your own protection. That is to keep you safe. Seconds, you're in, you're out. Elena McDougall, APTN National News, Hamilton. This week, hundreds of Indigenous students from across the country would have been taken to a stage in Toronto for a special dance performance. But like most public events, it was cancelled due to COVID-19. However, that didn't stop organizers from putting on a once-in-a-lifetime show. 
Brittany Hobson shows us how a national organization is using social media to share the students' successes. This year's outside looking in dance performance looked a little different due to COVID-19. Instead of traveling to Toronto to show off their skills, students participated in a virtual production. Outside Looking In founder Tracy Smith didn't want the students to lose out. This is really about being able for the OLI community to connect back together, uh, for the kids to see familiar faces, to see the choreographers. We're going to have some choreographers in, in the performance. Um, just to see us, for us to see them, and just to know that the OLI community is here. Smith started OLI in 2007. They have dance and mentorship programs in Indigenous communities. This year, about 200 students from across Canada were supposed to perform. Musicians Buffy St. Marie and Logan Stats were lined up. Actor Tamara Podemski was set to host. It didn't happen. Podemski says the COVID caused cancellation was heartbreaking. There's just something that you get with live theater, sharing space in an auditorium with, a, with, with an audience. Um, it just, it's magic and um it's uh and it's medicine it's a whole bunch of people together um you know in celebration in uh in in gratitude and uh and honoring these um these youth who've worked so hard the team still found a way to honor the students with virtual performances and interviews all i is great because it gives you great opportunities like to do things and learn things you never knew before i think it's a great way to step outside your comfort zone and try something new. Last year I went to the show and saw my sister dancing and it made me feel happy for her. It was her first year in the OLI program and she's always wanted to do it. It's programs like these that uh, that change the course of lives and, uh, and create a new exciting um, next generation. In the end, it may not have been the experience organizers were expecting, but moving it online showcased the program to a wider audience. This is a great opportunity for people to learn about the program and to, you know, to see how the arts and how dance specifically impacts and changes people's lives when they embark upon it over a consistent period of time. To watch the final show, head to Outside Looking In's Facebook page. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. I got to say, I wish I could move like some of those kids. That's uh, quite impressive. Well, that's been your look at APTN National News for this Friday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend.